When the magic caster went out and installed the two teleportation portals, they were forced to split their force in order to deal with the appearance of the enemy reinforcement. Upon Wilhelm's command, 120 knights went towards the one portal with the druid Borg, while the remaining went to help the Dark Knight Abdil and the rogue Ken. In the second group were only 64 knights with some who received light burns from the previous bombard of the masked magic casters in the sky. Though they were essentially almost half the many as the other group, the second third tier combated was supposed to balance off their number as a single third tier counted for dozens of second tier knights like them. But the reality in front of them was cruel. The Dark Knight left them in dust and penetrated the lines of the mutants, while the rogue can use them like meat shield to deliver the finishing blow on the mutants they were currently facing. Though they were outnumbering them, they soon realized the overwhelming strength of those arcanic mutants. Some of them had hands harder than any steel they had ever seen while their claws were sharper than their very own swords. Their body held an incredible amount of vitality that even the usual lethal attacks were nothing to them. Lastly, their behavior to kill them no matter the cost scared the knights. They were only of the second tier. They couldn't face dozen of third tier monstrosities. Although they were able to manage to reduce their numbers to a total of 12, to achieve such a feat they even lost a total of 40 men. Most of the reason why they killed so many was from the rogue Ken's strength of a third tier and not their own, resulting in them continuously retreating back. Even if doing so essential meant abandoning the idea of supporting the Dark Knight and letting the enemy continuously summon more reinforcements. Some of the knights were aware of that, and yet they still decided to retreat so that they don't end up like the others who died by the sharp claws of the arcanic mutants. Doing that, though, was nothing more than delaying their inevitable deaths. Knights were still falling victim to those mutants, and they could only do their best to prevent that from happening. F all at you is stories at nv, l slash by slash end, com. And in that moment of their desperation, several footsteps were to be felt going through the ground. The next thing they knew, the mutants were cut down by those who they thought had reached the end of their lives. For our leech, Wearing the armor of the Iradal dynasty and wielding the same swords as them, the people they considered friends and saw them fall at the hands of those mutants came flanking their killers from behind while yelling for our leech. H. How. One of the knights muttered with shaking lips as he this scene. The mutants reacted according to their instinct and lashed out at the new enemy with a fearless attitude. But unlike the knights who sought to live, the ones who they were facing now were knights neither tired nor hungered. And, by the command of their leech, they would also never fear. They were the undead. Overwhelmed by their number, the mutants were fatally wounded and dying like flies. And the one who was leading them killed most of the mutants with a swift swing of his cursed longsword. Falling down without any sign of movement, the Liege of the Dead, the Dark Knight Abdil raised his blade high and spread his ominous mana inside the corpses of the mutants. Upon the horrified gaze of the knights, they could only stand there and watch how the monstrosities they were desperately fighting against risen once more with their eyes glowing in a dark green light. The Dark Knight in question turned his head and stared at the knights. Though they couldn't see his expression, the knights felt that he looked at them with pure disdain. Turning next his head towards the rogue who looked at him with indifference, the Dark Knight spoke with a cold voice. You seem to be the only one at the passable level, even if only barely at that. The rogue Ken didn't react the slightest, but the knights in comparison felt a surge of anger as he essentially declared every one of them useless. HMPF, just seeing you all disgusting faces, I can guess what you are thinking. It doesn't he matter if you follow me or not. That were his last words before leaving the knights there and charging with his undead soldiers to help the other group. The only one who kept up with the undead was the rogue Ken, who was delivering slowing down so that he can be at the very back of the undead charge. 
Only then did it hit the knights that their fallen comrades became undead who followed the Dark Knight's command, L, which resulted in amplifying their hate and fear towards Abdil, the one who enslaved them by forbidden magic. Abdil, or rather Danzel didn't he care about their thoughts at all. Upon his command, the Draugr under his command charged through the side, giving the knights who were facing the mutants in a desperate battle a nice yet horrifying surprise. The Draugr fought like taking one mutant down with them even if it meant their own destruction. Compared to the group that Danzel was in, this group had failed to interrupt the magic caster's teleportation portal and allowed them to summon more reinforcements, making the number of mutants the same as the current knights. The druid borg support magic showed its strength in the fight the most. The roots that risen from the ground were able to take the mutants by surprise as their only focus was to kill the knights, while the minor wounds of the knights were healed by the second by his magic. Another spell he cast was of improving the nearby knight's stamina with one of his spells. And once he jumped into the fray, his hands were covered in fur while his fingers became sharp claws, becoming his natural weapons. In all of that, his chest was covered with a green light that resembled some sort of insect armor, increasing both his defense and offensive capabilities by a ton. But even then the number of wounds that he gained were numerous, and he couldn't he really deal a killing blow in one go against those mutants. The other big player in that group was Skullclaw the Death Hound. He held the most kills out of all of the knights combined. But because of that, he was also the target of all the magic casters that appeared. Though Wilhelm was giving his all to kill the masked magic caster, it seemed like he wasn't he specialized in spells that target individual targets, making things much harder for Skullclaw. In fact, when Danzel looked over Skullclaw, he was stunned at his half-broken skulls and he became much smaller than before. Rushing forward towards his only soul third-tier undead, Danzel cut down the mutants in his path. Once he was close enough to him, Danzel cast Restore Undying Body on Skullclaw. Repair this wronger vessel. Once the dead mana of the spell came in contact with Skullclaw, several bones started to regrow and cracks were disappearing by the second. It wasn't he enough to repair all the damage that she received, but it was enough for Skullclaw to sweep her claw and send several mutants flying. Quega. She howled in joy upon her liege once more. Though they were busy dealing with the nearby arcanic mutants, Danzel couldn't he help but notice the dark mist that surrounded Skullclaw's body. This is, it doesn't he look like, dark mist robe, considering the amount of mist, meaning that it should be the other skill, dark mist. Faintly remembering the skill's description, Danzel came up with an idea. Skullclaw, can you expand your dark mist? Hearing her liege's question, Skullclaw, who had just bitten a mutant, nodded her head while failing the mutant that was barely able to move his legs. Seeing the confirmation of Skullclaw, Danzel sends his command telepathically, before jumping on top of her back. Once he was seated in Skullclaw back, he suddenly felt his remaining senses improving together with his bloodlust. But the latter seemed to only improve his previous killing intent instead of affecting his mind. I should even read through her whole description. Danzel mumbled before starting his spell. Well, right after I finish with all this crap, I will have enough time to... Danzel thought before sending the signal for Skullclaw to begin the plan. In the next moment, Skullclaw suddenly howled at the sky, and the dark mist that surrounded her body the entire time expanded and exploded into the surroundings, covering the area of 30 meters in an instant. Shrouded by the sudden mist made the knights were confused, making many of them die from the mutants they were facing. The undead in comparison fought just like before against the mutants who fought whoever was in front of the, except other mutants. With chaos spreading among the knights, the druid Borg fell to the ground shaking for a split second. The magic casters who saw the dark mist didn't he know what to do. They couldn't he just shoot their spells with the risk of killing the mutants. 
So they just waited above the teleportation portal, waiting for the mist to disappear. But it was at this moment when the dark mist seemed only to stay in place to move towards their exact location at incredible speed. And before they could react, the dark mist that came out revealed to but the death hound opening his mouth wide open with his rider whose long sword glowed in a dark green light. Feeling the killing intent and the pressure that those two let out, the masked magic caster panicked and raised their hands to cast their spells. But it was too late. Die, with those words echoing in their minds by a cold voice, all they saw was a dark green light engulfing them. To think that my mana pool that seemed almost infinite would have been spent in such a short amount of time. Danzel mumbled to himself as he gazed at his surroundings. Wherever he looked, they were either bloodied corpses of the knights or the mutants that were slain. Among those corpses were also his undead that had fallen in battle. After jumping with Skull Claw together in the backlands, it didn't he take much effort to stop the magic caster from operating the teleportation portal. Once his soul reaping wind met with the accurate magic caster, they could only shout in pain before falling down dead to the ground. At that point, those two began their own slaughter in the enemy's back. The masked magic caster who flew in the air did prove to be of nuisance to both of them, but even they were shot down by Sarah the Elven Archers. And since her arrows were many times faster than their flying speed and their reaction alone, that brought them into an awkward situation. Below them was both a death hound which bit on the mutants together with its master that had an incredible scary aura leave his body, both eyeing them like some starved hyenas who stared at some wagyu steak. Though their fear didn't he affect their performance in battle as they have trained against that, they would have been stupid to go in the range of those two. Alas, the archers in the far were killing them with each arrow that was shot, forcing them to go descended and hopefully use the mutants as meat shields. And one could clearly see by their corpses on the ground that this didn't he go as well as they had hoped. Walking towards the corpses of the masked magic caster, Danzel decided to store each body inside his storage ring for potential magic items. Though I don't have much hope for that, Danzel thought as to how Skull Claw bit one of them and he slashed them. At this point, their robes should be rags. As for other items, if they truly were any, he would rather check later than have any of the others claim his spoils by the excuse of stealing the Dynasty War spoils. You can guys can pick whoever weapons and armor you like the most. Danzel sends his command to the Draugrs. Having raised some mid-fight, only 37 Draugrs remained, most of them being of the corpses of the knights that of mutants. Though Danzel would have liked to raise purely only mutants as undead since they had better bodies, he still went for the knights as the bodies of the mutants were heavily damaged and would affect the performance of the newly raised undead. If he had both the mana and the time, he wouldn't he have minded using restore undying body on the corpses and then raising them as undead. Alas, that wasn't he the case. Moving past his undead, the knights moved to the side and stared at him with disdain and fear. But Danzel ignored all of them. Right behind his back was Skull Claw following after his steps, and the Draugr followed behind her. Once Danzel stopped in front of Wilhelm, they also stopped. Sir Wilhelm, the enemy has been exterminated. What will we do now? Well, we retreat or stay? Danzel asked with his cold voice. Wilhelm in question was woken up from his stubbornness as he replied to the Dark Knight's question. We will stay here, Necromancer Abdiel. After a short break, I will start casting my spells once more. As I will be vulnerable when casting, I will rely on your protection, Wilhelm said. Danzel in response only nodded his head at him before walking with his undead to the side. You can sit down now. Danzel said to Skull Claw, who as result did as her master said. Seating to the ground, Danzel touched the cracks on Skull Claw's ribs. Unfortunately, you will have to deal with those alone for now. Danzel mumbled before sending his Draugr a command. 
spread in the surroundings and watch out for a potential ambushed. Hearing their liege's will and command, the Draugr nodded before spreading and watching vigilantly at their surroundings. Although sending them out wasn't necessary, having them all gathered around me is quite awkward, Danzel thought secretly before putting his focus back on Skullclaw. To be more specific, he focused his gaze on her status screen. They were in total three things that he didn't he know about her status. And those were Mount of Dead Warrior, Death Howl, and Dying Hunter S. Mark. When he started reading them one by one, he found out that Mount of Dead Warrior was the reason why his killing intent was increased the moment he mounted Skull Claw. It seemed to be a new talent that she gained upon her evolution. According to the description, the master that was picked by the undead servant talent would have his killing intent amplified when the master mounts her by a total of 10%. Considering that it didn't he affect one's mind and that Danzel had Sin of Wrath, such an effect was quite nice to have as a passive. Death Howl, in comparison, was a skill, but it was also a passive effect, which resulted in her hull strengthening her survival instincts and amplifying the effect of fear on her enemies. Though the former sounded like a buff, it wasn't in some situations. If a group had its own survival in mind, it will disrupt teamwork. Where fear would lead them to panic, resulting in chaos amongst groups if the effect is activated fully. Considering how much she howled in the battle against the mutants, Danzel couldn't he help but grin bitterly at the fact that Skull Claw friendly fired the knights with her howls. Though since he wore a helmet and had a skull for a face, one couldn't he possibly see his bitter smile. The last skill he read was the most interesting out of all of them, in his opinion. As Dying Hunter S. Mark was actually his first ever seen permanent curse spell he saw. Wherever he searched for a book that had the topic of curses in it back, when he was dealing with the Shadow Merchant Hansen, there was as good as no information except the fact that they were famous for being permanent. His Curse of Scourge and Curse of Exhaustion both had a limited range and a duration time. So seeing Skull Claw possessing such a spell, he felt somewhat jealous. In truth, Dying Hunter S. Mark was a buff that is put on one's body. If an enemy was hit with that body part that the spell was put on, the curse will activate and put a permanent curse on the enemy which made the one who cast her the curse always be able to track the cursed one. A particular annoying skill if one wanted to run away. It seems that Skull Claw doesn't t have any long-ranged attacks after all. She is more focused on melee combat, it seems. Danzel thought before drawing his hand off her ribs. I guess it is time to check my spoils. Danzel mumbled to himself before opening his status window. With the blue floating window appearing in front of him, Danzel gazed at the very bottom where his spoils were. XP 4,865,300 Staring at the XP that he gained, Danzel had to take a second look just to confirm that what he was seeing wasn't he an illusion. It shouldn't he be that high, Danzel thought to himself. It wasn't he that he wasn't he happy with the amount of XP that he swooped in one go. On average, the mutants were giving him around 40,000 to 50,000 XP. Visit N0, V, L slash B, I, and death for the best novel reading experience. For killing someone of the third tier, this amount of XP wasn't he that great. But the XP was still quite a hefty amount for just a single skill. Considering that he had to train for a whole of four hours to receive 40,000 XP, it was nice saving so much XP by just killing those mutants. But even then, that didn't he explain why he had so much XP left. Counting the XP that gained from doing all the contracts and the slaughter of those mutants, he should have around 900,000 XP less than now. Then it hit him. Rune of Harvest. It has to be either Agars or Azrael that deliver such amount of XP. And as if proofing his suspicions, out of nowhere, he just gained a total of 7,000 XP. There must have been a slaughter somewhere. Danzel, though. 
I gained such benefits by only having two harvesters. If they were more of them, then how much XP would I gain? Just thinking of gaining hundreds of XP by doing literally nothing but a grin to himself. I will have to see how to equip Vanessa and Sardin with it, but that can wait. For now, I should focus on those gains. Having once more such a great amount of XP in his hands, Danzel couldn't he help but get excited. Be it increasing his black guard level or bringing his new skills into the third tier, Danzel couldn't he help but already fantasy about what to spend his pocket money on. But before he could do such, the remaining group of knights came toward him with hostile faces. You vile necromancer, release our comrades from your reign. You have already abused their rest long enough with your magic. The one who was leading the group of knights shouted while pointing at Danzel. Danzel, who was in a good mood till now, became frustrated at the knights who came seeking trouble. He was so annoyed, in fact, that for a split second, his bloodlust washed over all the knights. Why did it have to be now of all times? Danzel cursed internally as he walked towards the group of knights. K-R-G-G-G-H-H. Skullclaw, who felt her liege's aura, risen up and growled towards the knights while she started to become bigger. Seeing the three dark green flames staring at them, the knights pulled their swords and pointed them towards Skullclaw. But internally, they were quite afraid of her. Skullclaw, it s all right, I will deal with those things. Danzel said with his cold voice. The leader among the knights, who was also the oldest knight, here couldn't he help but frown at them being referred to as things. He was about to complain at Necromancer's use of words, but once Danzel stood in front of him it was as if a cat bit his tongue. Not only was Danzel letting out a terrifying aura, but together with his black armor which made him look quite ominous, and the fact that Danzel was 2.53 meters high, he towered those guys. Most of the knights were on the taller side around 1.83 to 1.95 meters. But only now did they realize the height difference between them. What did you mean by that? Danzel asked with a voice that brought chills down the spins of the knights. The knights, though, didn't he refuse to give in to the pressure. It us exactly as I said. Mercenaries, Abdeel. Not only did your undead bring forth many casualties among the Iaradal dynasty, but you continue to use your vile magic to control our comrades even in death. Such an arrangement I can t accept. The leader of the knights yelled while glaring back at Danzel. Hearing what they had to say, Danzel's ethereal dark green eyes flared up. Are those guys such idiots? That was the first thing that came to Danzel's mind. Of course, Danzel acknowledges that the knight had a point. If Danzel didn't he give Skullclaw the command to spread her mist to the battlefield, then there would have been fewer casualties than are now as the mist essentially blinded the knights and lead them to their doom against the Arcanic Mutants. Not only that, but Skullclaw was also using the skill, Death Howl, which affected the knights' mental state. It could also be argued that the Draugr's placement on the battlefield didn't he favor the knights at all. If he commanded his undead currently, and had used them as meat shields for the knights, although more of his undead would die, there would be fewer casualties among the knights. But Danzel suspected that the knight leader was talking more about the first two points. The thought that puzzled him the most was how those guys got the nerve to come and complain to him. He was the one responsible for killing the most enemies and shutting down the portals, hence stopping the enemy's reinforcements from coming. Not only that, but his undead played a huge role in taking the mutants' attention away from the knights. Essentially, if he wasn't he there, everyone dying here was the most likely outcome. What puzzled him the most, though, was how those guys got the balls to go against a third-tier expert who reached the peak. ISN'd T he afraid of dying? Danzel thought for a moment before he noticed the look of the other mercenaries group. They looked at the knight dissatisfied and even the elven archers were complaining out loud with the other three. Just because we are mercenaries they think we are inferior to them. If it were in T for the money I would even draw my bow and... Though they were quite far away from them, 
Danzel was still able to hear Sarah's complaints with the hearing of the third tier. That was when he understood where those knights' confidence came from. They looked down on me because of my status. Once he figured that out, he truly found it. Stupid. Danzel whispered to himself loud enough for the knight leader to hear. W, what did you just say? The knighted asked back with an angered tone. Ignoring the old knight, Danzel turned to look towards the one magic caster who was taking the role of commander. The one who he was supposed to protect was the son of the duke, Wilhelm Ionars. Meeting each other's gaze, it was obvious that the noble was aware of what was going on. Aren't you going to step in? Danzel thought internally as he gazed at Wilhelm. To his surprise, Wilhelm simply turned around and seemed to ignore the whole situation, as if telling him to deal with it. It seemed like he didn't want to take any responsibility at all. From a commander's standpoint, something like this was foolish, as letting such behavior continue would undoubtedly create internal conflict with his troops. But from a noble standpoint, it was the right choice. Helping Danzel, who was using necromancy, could be turned into a scandal that could be used against him. For someone who wanted to steal the heir position from his unworthy brother, he couldn't he effort being in part of such a scandal. And after seeing Danzel's strength, he was sure that the knights could do nothing against him, even if they wanted to. So, he chose to let things go their natural course. So, you are going to be a bystander, huh, Danzel though? Hey, why aren't you responding? I said Dash. I heard you loud and clear, Danzel said with his cold voice while looking down at the old knight. So, what do you want from me? Pointing at the undead who patrolled the surroundings, the old knight said, We want you to release our comrades from your spell and let them go back to their rest. Looking at the undead that the old knight was pointing to, Danzel's next words shocked him. What if I tell you that I don't you want to? Danzel said before faintly sensing someone familiar watching him. H huh. Hearing what he said, the old knight together with the others was slightly stunned at such a response. If a mere mercenary doesn't t let our fallen comrades who fought with bravery to final rest, then I and the other knights would be forced to use force against you dash. Is that so? Danzel didn't t let him finish his sentence. With a swift movement of his hand, Danzel draw his long sword out of its sheath and swung it with the speed that none of the knights could react. Asterisk sign. Before any of them realized what just happened, the old knight was decapitated in an instant. His flying head as much as his body began to let out his still warm blood. You received 15,000 XP. Na slash w novel chapter s are published on no slash bell slash bend co slash m ignoring the notification danzel looked down on the other knights and let his killing intent suffocate them i am fine with fighting everyone here present danzel said with his ice cold voice realizing what just happened the knights yelled furiously you crazy traitor of iradle Damn mercenary. Many of the knights cursed at him many and rushed at him with their weapons in hand. Danzel of course reacted in kind. Everyone who came close to him was immediately cut down by his long sword. The knights couldn't even react and many didn't know when they were cut down. Seeing the situation escalating for the worse, both Wilhelm and the mercenaries were shocked. What are you all doing? Stop this farce immediately. Wilhelm yelled with a pale face. Damn it. How did things escalate to this point? He cursed internally. The worst that he expected was that Abdiel would give a beating to all those knights so that they realized their place. But he never expected him to raise his blade and start to kill the knights as if they were vegetables. If he knew that such things will occur, he would even step in and stop those knights. Who would have thought that Abdiel would have such a short temper? The knights who heard Wilhelm's command created distance between the mad necromancer. Each had their weapons drawn and pointed to Danzel. The nature daggers mercenaries also walked close to the knights, 
them also being wary of the necromancer's next move. But in the next moment, all undead that was sent to patrol the surroundings came back and walked behind Danzel. Their dark green flames look at the living with hostility. In the middle of this group were a total of ten corpses of the knights. Mercenaries Abdeel. What is all of this supposed to mean? Wilhelm said with a heavy tone. The death of the knights could have been prevented. He didn't he care for their lives, but because their deaths could have been prevented, as the commander of the knights, he would be put responsible. Considering that Abdil comes from a mercenary group and that most members are of the fourth tier and also that he was sent by his highness to be his bodyguard, he couldn't he just put the whole blame on him. Though the easiest method would be in saying that he betrayed the dynasty, that would risk having bad blood with the Death Full Skulls group, a powerhouse that decided to side with the dynasty. The deal with this group was extremely important to Dynasty, which lacked the force to fight back against the two kingdoms. And if he was the reason why the deal went south, the chances of him becoming the heir of his house, even with his highness's support, would become impossible. While Wilhelm was thinking of hundreds of scenarios that could go wrong, the Dark Knight shrugged his shoulders. As you should be aware of, you knights resorted to using force. For this reason, I was forced to defend myself, he said in his cold voice. Wilhelm was about to say something but was swiftly interrupted by the appearance of a beautiful dark-skinned woman. I even return with spoils of war. The figure being Vanessa, she yelled out loud before going towards the middle of the group. Her supposed spoils of war were a total of three heads of some well-known third-tier magic caster that were on the battlefield. Looking at the corpse of the knights on the ground, she decided to throw the heads at them before walking to Danzel while patting her two hands together as if wanting to remove the non-existent dust. Damn, I was expecting to see you beating those guys. But I didn't expect you to kill them. Hee <laughs> hee, how cruel of you, Abdeel. Vanessa said while walking beside Danzel. So the presence that I felt a moment ago was you, huh? Danzel said while looking at Vanessa. Once he started talking with the knights before, he faintly sensed a figure behind him watching, knowing that it was Vanessa. Since she was watching everything happening, he decided to be bold and kill those idiots. Wilhelm, who released that Vanessa was a witness to what just happened, cursed internally. After Vanessa's arrival and her being a witness to the whole situation, Wilhelm decided to blame the knights for using force against their allies. That decision alone made the knights feel extremely bitter and angry at the noble. He was the one who cut down our people. How are we getting blamed and not this outsider? They thought in unison. Of course, such thoughts were only internally and not spoken out loud, especially in the presence of the necromancer. To them and the army, Finding trouble with mercenaries was pretty common. As usual, they held a higher status than some hired killers. Most of them followed their respective commanders who were both experienced soldiers and of nobility, making a social circle around the military. Those 200 knights were actually being lent to Wilhelm for the sake of repairing a favor in the future towards the commander they were following. In other words, Messing with them could also be interpreted as messing with the higher-ups of the army commanders, allowing them to abuse their non-existent authority to look down on mercenaries. But they never expected that the necromancer Abdeel would resort to killing them, and not even get the blame for this. Making the knights look at Wilhelm and Danzel in resentment without even trying to show their attitude towards them. In comparison, Danzel, who was riding Skull Claw with his undead following beside her, didn't he care the slightest about the looks that they were giving him. He was simply staring at his status, wondering what to upgrade with the newly acquired XP. But since he was being pestered by a certain dark elf, he couldn't he focus on what to choose. Hey, Abdeel, why are you staring in front of you like that? Is something in front of us that I can t see? so loud. Danzel sighed internally before closing his status. No, I was just thinking about some stuff. 
Hmm, is that so? Anyway, do you think it was wise to seek trouble with those guys? In my experience, humans can be pretty petty. She said while jumping on top of Skull Claw and standing with her feet on her back. K-R-G-G-G-H. Skull Claw, of course, growled in dissatisfaction, turning her head and showing her sharp fangs. Only after Danzel calmed Skull Claw down did he answer Vanessa. It doesn't he matter. If they come to seek trouble again, I will simply turn them like those guys over there. Danzel said as he pointed at his draugers, most of them being turned from the corpses of the knights. By the way, did Master Velker tell you about my race? Danzel said with a more serious and cold tone. Vanessa in turn shook her head. Nah, I just made an assumption based on our group and you. Well, physical appearance. Our group, Deathful Skulls only accepted those who weren't humans, at the very least that s what the boss said to us. As for your physical appearance, well, it is pretty obvious that you aren't a human considering how big you are. Vanessa said before sitting behind Danzel, making him slightly uncomparable. Hearing her reasoning, Danzel couldn't he help but be reminded of his height. Right, humans don't he grow so tall. I should think of another race to act as, Danzel thought while making a mental note for that. Then what race do you think I am? Danzel asked to gather information. He could use what she said as a reference for the future. Well, Sartan told me that you don't he smell like an orc. Considering that you are wearing a helmet, you shouldn't he be a troll either. MHM, you also know Agars and Little Shiro, so my guess is that you are the same race as them. How is that, am I right? Am not useful at all Danzel sighed once more internally. Till now he still didn't he see the status window of both of those two and they didn't he tell him either what they were. Agars looked like a human that was on the taller side while Shiro looked unusually pale human child. Who knows? Danzel answered. Eh, tell me. Do I mean Abdil? You know my race. It s only fair to give me yours too. Ugh, so loud. Na slash w novel chapter s are published on no slash bell slash bend. Co slash m. After hours of walking back into the castle, Danzel was guided to his resting room, which was nothing more than a small room that only had a bed, a desk, and a small box made of straw, supposedly to be for his loudly. Except for Skull Claw, who was given his own room in a stale, where they kept the horses, all his remaining undead were put on hold outside the walls of the castle for obvious reasons. Outside in the field, he could use the excuse of using the dead as temporary forces to secure their safety. But keeping the undead and creating a personal small army right in front of their doors was a big no-no in the army. Not only did it bring great displeasure to the soldiers, but it was also a countermeasure in case the necromancer comes out to be a traitor and commanded a small army right in front of their doors. The fact that he resorted to violence toward the knights also didn't he help the situation. They did tell him that they will consider keeping the undead and that is currently discussed among the higher-ups, but Danzel saw it as nothing but a farce. The most likely outcome would be them requesting in stopping his spell. In other words, kill his own undead. Greater raise undead wasn't he a spell that controlled corpses, but in truth, it was a spell that was born undead and brought the control of the one who raised them. If they wanted to get rid of them, he had to literally command them to kill themselves by breaking their skulls with their weapons. There wasn't he an off and on switch that made his undead simple become corpses once more. In fact, if Danzel abandoned an undead somewhere far away, his control over that one undead would disappear through the passage of time which took years, if not decades. Still, giving such order to them. Thinking of that, Danzel's mood worsens. Seating on the bead, he shook his head to remove such thoughts. No matter, I should just focus on what should be done and nothing more. He said before opening his status screen. They were a total of six skills that he kept to test first and then upgrade. And does were the following. Hand of Mana Affinity. Restore Undying Body. Cursed Wounds Blade. 
Greater Death Blast. One with Death. Rune Removal. Every single one of those skills was of level 9, and since they were the second tier skills, the next upgrade would bring them to the modification stage, which, to his experience, was the point where one skill rose in power significantly. Though they were expensive to upgrade, considering the amount of XP in his wallet, it wasn't he that expensive. He already had an idea in mind in which direction the skills should be modified. He decided that three of those skills, them being Rune Removal, One with Death, Restore Undying Body, would simple need their power adjusted instead of reforming them to become something anew. Rune Removal simply needed to be a skill that removed his runes and nothing more, but for the sake of the several bonuses that he had, he decided that choose Dead Mana Affinity and Overall Improvement. Instead of Dead Mana Affinity, he could even choose to pick Soul Affinity, as both of them would have worked increasing the effectiveness of the skill, but he chose the latter as it affects more physical in nature. As the overall improvement was a must for his aim. What came out was a skill with the name of Death Rune Removal. By its description, he could probably erase runes that were carved in yellow shown areas of an item. As his choice, it was an overall improvement in his skill. But that wasn't he all. The runes that were categorized as Undead Rune would be much easier erased from an item than usual runes. Considering that he chose Affinity Carving Mastery and Mastery of Himself, four talents way back then, such an effect was convenient. As for the next skill, one with death, Danzel only wanted to improve the 10% improvement of the dead mana mastery part of the skill instead of the natural mana and health regeneration. He now had the means to recover his body and even if his mana regeneration increased, it wouldn't he be of much use in a fight. So he decided to choose the soul affinity option together with the power improvement. The former was chosen as this skill was already a death-type skill and choosing dead mana affinity could be somewhat of a waste. Instead, giving him more control of his own mana affinity was much better. As for the latter, he chose it because the other option was too vague. They were options such as improve regeneration, undead effect improvement, and so on. Nothing specific targets the mana affinity improvements. So, Danzel chose power improvent, as it sound the most likely of it being what he wanted. The outcome of that two modifications was something that he didn't he expect. The skill, one with death, turns into corrupted soul. Though some anomaly you, corrupted soul, turned into soul of death. This is. Danzel was surprised to see this message appear. He remembered how this message appeared once back when he was in the curse lake. He didn't he expect to see it again now of all times. Opening the description of the newly acquired skill, Danzel started reading. Soul of Death, a undead who managed to corrupt his own soul with death, resulting in the host soul never again being able to use a living vessel to host his soul. Both Dead Mana Affinity and Soul Affinity Mastery will be increased by a total of 25%. Also, increase both Vessel and Soul Mana and Health Regeneration by a total of 30%. This skill can only be owned by an undead being. Additionally, the soul will be able to keep its presence in... Reading the description... Danzel couldn't he help but have slightly suspicious that the skill, Soul of Death Essence, skill be involved in the appearance of the message. As far as he remembered, the skill said that it made his soul more accustomed to dead mana itself. But it didn't he mention that the soul was fully accustomed to dead mana. But now probably because of the skill, his soul should be fully accustomed to dead mana and soul affinity. Once the skill manifested, he felt more connected to himself, or rather his own mana. Considering the sudden increase of the mastery of dead mana affinity and his soul affinity, such a change was not he surprising. His own mana had always had a hint of soul affinity and dead mana in it. Because of being undead, he could turn his mana more easily into dead mana than other types of mana. 
That also goes for what he calls soul mana, which came from his soul affinity. The latter, though, he couldn't to use as much as the former as it was rather unknown to him. All he knew of how to use this mana was to activate Mortal Reminder and Soul Reaping Wind, where he now probably raises an undead by just pouring his dead mana into a corpse. Though it wouldn't he turn as strong as when he used the spell Greater Raise Undead, it was still something. He could also do some other stuff, but he considered them more of party tricks than of a genuine spell or technique. I can hold a much firmer control now, but I still don't he know how to use it. Danzel thought as he stared at his skeleton hand that was engulfed with dark green mana. Shaking his hand, he equipped his gauntlet once more and decided to leave it at that. Other than that, I didn't he expect my natural regeneration to decrease by so much. Although now the effect covers my soul too. Also, the last sentence also has another. Description. Considering the context, it should be a location such as maybe the realm of the dead? There I s end too much information to say for sure. Overall, he was happy with how the skill turned out. The mana mastery of both his affinity improved tremendously while his health regeneration decreased by a bit where his mana regeneration increased. He suspected that the power improvement would, at the cost of decreasing a part of the skill, would in turn increase another skill much better. He concluded that more experimentation was needed to see if he was right. In the future, I can test it by buying other useless skills anyway, Danzel thought before going to the next skill on his upgrade list, which were the Restore Undying Body, a spell that repaired the damage of an undead. It wasn't he like the Undead Reconstruction, which repaired corpses, but it healed the undead. He recently used the spell to repair his body in the fight between mutants and the masked magic casters. Though it has done its job by repairing his body, he had to use it multiple times to repair the damage to his body, essentially using his mana and time that could have been used to use other spells. And for its modification, he decided to pick dead mana affinity and overall improvement. He could have chosen something else for the former option as it was a death-type spell. He still chose that combination as usually. The affinity option was similar to the overall improvement option. Rather than having fasting casting mediocre heal or a strong heal which required time to cast, he liked to have the best of both sides. And what came out was a skill named Necromatic Restoration. It essentially improved the casting time of the spell and its chant by the spell's name and also improved the healing together with its range. Additionally, it also recovered a bit of mana on the target, but the amount of the mana restoration wasn't to the point where one could infinitely restore one mana by the spell. Of course, this spell could only be used towards the undead. Danzel was also satisfied with how the skill came out. He wanted the spell to simply heal and nothing else. That also went for the other two skills. They just needed a simple increase of changing them into something else. But for the other three skills, he wanted to change them to some extent. For example, Greater Death Blast wasn't he designed to have much firepower and instead focused on inflicting a decay effect on others. He liked to use it together with Soul Reaping Wind as it would send out a barrage of long-ranged attacks. And since it was a spell and Soul Reaping Wind was more of a sword technique, he could use both at the same time. But since the latter was much faster and more deadly than the former, it was left out by its senior, Soul Reaping Wind. But choosing a second modification for such a spell was extremely hard to decide. The first modification was Speed Improvement. Such an option was essential in order to enable the spell to keep up with its senior. There were a total of five other options if one ignored the two affinities. Power Improvement. Decay Improvement. Acidic Improvement. Curse. Overall Improvement. He is right of written about both Overall Improvement and Power Improvement. He wanted a specialized spell so the former was a no while the latter could potentially increase the impact force of the spell and decrease everything else for all he knew. 
He didn't he want to risk betting on the latter and ruin his spell. The question now was which of the other three to choose. Decay and Acidic were pretty similar yet different. If the spell hit its target, the former would quickly start once the opponent has its flesh rot just like the Cursed Wounds Blade effect, but if he were to improve the Acidic part, he would right off melt his opponent's flesh and potentially damage his enemy's sword or armor. Both had their pro and cons, but in the end, that two modifications didn't he improve the fatal weakness of this spell. This one is that for damage to take place, the spell needed to have physical contact with the spell. For that reason alone, he chose to pick the curse option, as curses were essentially one of the hardest types of spell to defend against. Any defense type spell would be right off ignored in the face of curse spells. The only spell that specialized against curses could defend against them. The spell ISN T lethal anyway, it should be much more annoying to face if the spell were to turn into a curse. Danzel said as he chose the two modifications. The modification for the Greater Death Blast has been chosen up Ted Chapters N and Velbin. Com. Greater Death Blast LV.10 becomes Curse of Five Bindings LV.1. Curse of Five Bindings. Manifest one dead mana into a gathering of miasma to shoot out at one's target. With the miasma holding a terrible curse, once an enemy is hit, they will receive a minor decay effect before the curses latch on the target's body and drain them from their strength for a certain amount of time. Each hit of this spell will reduce the attributes of the target by a total of 1% and increase the decay effect. This effect stacks a total of 5 times and lasts 10 minutes per stack. Hmm. A curse that reduced one's strength, huh? Not exactly what I hope to gain, Danzel said in disappointment. In theory, the spell was incredible, but in practice hitting, one enemy with the same spell five times in total was extremely difficult. But since it was a curse, it was much easier to hit opponents that didn't he have a response. Well, you win some, you lose some, I guess. Danzel shrugged it off and went to the next one. Next in the line was... Cursed Wounds Blade. Here the question lay wherever he wanted to increase the healing reduction or the decayed part of the skill. But after considering it for a bit, he decided to go for both affinity options this time around. Improving the skill alone was tempting. Each wound by his blade would become all the more lethal. Even the slightest scratch could prove to be quite harmful considering the decay. And since healing wouldn't be as effective, he sure bet it would be a headache for his enemies. In the end, though he chose the two affinities, the reason for it was that he wanted his sword to directly inflict damage on one soul. If he could now grade the soul-damaging part into the skill and later on focus on improving it, his sword will be on many more levels lethal. At least that was his hope on this modification. Soon after the modification was done, the skill, Cursed Wounds Blade, turned into Siphoning Soul Blade. Reading the description, Danzel's ethereal eyes lighten up in shock. Siphoning Soul Blade, a curse put into a cruel blade wielded by a cruel master. Each wound inflicted by the cursed blade will place a cursed mark on the wound. The cursed mark will periodically drain one's vitality and soul essence and transfer them to the cursed sword. Once someone's soul essence has been drained fully, the body of the victim will start to collapse. The more the same cursed sword drains one, the more powerful this effect will be. There is a chance that this sword will become cursed and inflict the same effect on others other than its wielder. This skill has terrifying potential, Danzel said with a hint of excitement in his sword. Drawing his sword and looking at the blade, Danzel shouted internally, You will be my first cursed blade. Danzel's determination to turn his long sword of the Sand Emperor's blade into a truly cursed blade was pretty high. The potential that the skill, Siphoning Soul Blade, had was enormous as it could infinitely make the skill stronger, even if he didn't upgrade it at all. Such a powerful skill is only on its third tier. 
I can't even imagine how the skill will turn out after reaching the max level. Danzel, though. I wonder how much each upgrade costs. Danzel thought before opening the cost of Siphoning Soul Blade upgrade. Siphoning Soul Blade cost 700,000 XP plus 50,000 per level. Seeing the cost of the skill, if Danzel had a heart, by now he would be experiencing a heart attack. Most of the third tier skills generally cost around 350,000 to 500,000 XP in total. But this skill reached a total of 700,000 XP. The only other skill that cost so much was Soul of Death Essence. Luckily though, thanks to his talent, superior unique Concionis, and the passive skill, Soul of Death Essence. He gained a total of 45% discount on upgrading skills that had soul affinity. And that skill that was categorized as death skills was instead only at 25%. Sadly, the talent, superior unique Concionis, didn't he cover for his death skills. So instead of paying 700,000 for the first level, he now only had to pay a total of 385,000 XP, which almost was half the price. It isnt that bad now that I think about it. Danzel thought as he finished calculating the cost. Thanks to his 660 intelligence, his mind was so efficient that making such calculations took him a mere second to finish. I guess I should increase it at the very least at level 9 in the future, but now, the remaining is somewhere else needed. Danzel said before closing the siphoning soul blade window. He had already decided on where all this XP would be used for now. I guess the last remaining is Hand of Mana Affinity. It waited long enough to reach its third tier. Danzel mumbled to himself before pressing the upgrade window. Hand of Mana Affinity level has increased from LV.9 to LV.10. The skill Hand of Mana Affinity has reached this maximum level. The skill Hand of Mana Affinity reached the modification stage. Choose two of the given options for the skill to focus on. Dead Mana Affinity. Soul Affinity. Projectiles Increase. Speed Improvement. Durability. Power Increase. Scanning the given option, other than Projectiles Increase, the other option wasn't he that particularly exciting. He guessed if he picked Projectiles Increase, he would be capable to summon more than two hands at the same time. Considering how the spell was mostly used by other magic casters, projectiles increase would probably be the best choice. The more hands one had, the more convinced it was after all. But since Danzel used the skill in a more combat-oriented way, he decided to ignore that option. He also went ahead and ruled out choice the speed improvement, as it wasn't he as valuable as the other options. After stepping on the third tier, the usage that Hand of Mana Affinity had seen started to lessen, and for a good reason at that. They were fragile and lacked the strength to stop those of the third tier. They were barely enough to disturb a second tier expert's movements, and that is if they were taken by surprise. But even then, Danzel hesitated in choosing the durability and power increase options as it would probably turn the skill to be barely usable against third tier experts. One had to remember that this was by level 9 of the skill. Even if third-tier skills were much stronger than their second-tier past form, that also went for people who became third-tier. If it just improves, then it isnt going to be enough to use against those with a similar level as me. It will end up being used as just picking up my stuff from the ground. Wanting to avoid such a fate for a much-loved skill of his, Danzel decided to go to another room with Hand of Mana Affinity. And it was by picking both Dead Mana Affinity and Soul Affinity in hopes to change the effect like how it was done with Mortal Reminder. He hoped for the latter option to turn the skill into some form of ethereal form and fix the durability problem somehow, whereas the former option was simple to place some sort of effect that would damage his opponents, such as a decaying effect or a curse. Anything to solve the firepower of this skill would be a blessing at this point. That s how hopeless of a situation Danzel found the Hand of Mana Affinity skill to be. Even though it s my favorite skill, I will have to risk it. 
Danzel thought slightly hesitant. Finding no other solution to the current problem, he went ahead and picked both affinities. The modification for the skill Hand of Mana affinity has been chosen. Hand of Mana affinity LV.10 becomes Grasp of the Undying LV.1. Grasp of the Undying, the caressing touch of an undying being on one soul. The undying being forms an ethereal hand made out of soul essence to influence the physical world. If the hand starts to influence the physical world, then it becomes visible. Additionally, if the object that the hand touches hold a soul, then one is capable to pull some of one's vitality and soul essence while also dragging the part it touches in a certain direction in a short amount of time. The pulled away vitality and soul essence are then sent to the undying being to recover himself. The skill can always influence the physical world, but pulling once soul essence and vitality has a cooldown of two minutes. Sigh. Fortunately, it went well. Danzel sighed out loud in relief. Bearing through the headache that he received from all the previous upgrades, Danzel followed the information given to him and manifested the grasp of the undying skill in front of him. Compared to the Hand of Mana Affinity, where it looked like a floating gauntlet, Grasp of the Undying looked totally different. It looked like his dark green skeleton hand where the fingertips of the hand excluded a much intensive color, making the fingers look like sharp claws. Pulling his sword out of its sheath, Danzel gave it to the skeleton hand. Once it made contact with his sword, the skeleton hand seemed as if it became a much darker color, whereas when it wasn't he touching his sword it became a much lighter color. So that is how it works, huh? It should be invisible to others, but I guess since I am the caster, I am able to see it. We'll have to test it tomorrow. Taking his sword back, Danzel made the skeleton hand disappear before looking at his total XP. XP, 4,585,800. It seemed like the harvesters brought some extra XP in the meantime. Danzel thought internally before focusing back on his status screen. More specifically, he focuses on his Blackguard class. Blackguard LV.1, 50,000 plus 5,000 XP per level. MHM, that should be enough XP to level up my class a couple of levels. Pressing the upgrade option on the window, Danzel watched how a wave of notifications appeared in front of him and how his XP was being drained at an alarming rate. Blackguard level has increased from LV.1 to LV.2. Blackguard level has increased from LV.12 to LV.13. Blackguard level has increased from LV.30 to LV.31. Strength increased by 120, agility increased by 90, intelligence 120, endurance 120. You gained 90 attribute points. A part of the Black Guard skills have been unlocked. Full 0W current novels on N slash O slash V slash 3L slash V and Co slash M. With the surge of power overwhelming his body, Danzel glanced at his hand a few times before nodding in satisfaction. He was quickly able to adjust to the changes to his stats since he was used to being affected by Sin of Wrath. Though he much more attributes now than when he was affected by the talent, it wasn't he to the point of being unable to control his strength. After all, he experienced such sort of thing more than one time. Status. Status. Name. Rue Danzel. Level. 100 max. Race. White. Class. Black Guard LV. 31. Subclass. Rinsmith of Undeath LV.80. Health. 33367-33367. Mana. 79987-79. Attribute points. 90. Attributes. Strength. 673 agility, 936 intelligence, 720 endurance, 591. Great Rune, Great Rune of Undeath Existence. Talents, 
Superior Undead, Sin of Wrath, Reinforced Soul, Superior Unique Consciousness, Rune Vision, Dead Rune Knowledge, Undead Carver, Dead Mana Affinity, Dead Mana Resilience, Undying, Lower Class Death Magic, Mastery of Himself, Affinity Carving Mastery, Skills, Death Guarding Swordsmanship LV.1, Stone Wall LV.1, High Jump LV.1, Presentless Steps LV.1, Soul of Death Essence LV.1, Swift Movements LV1, Shield Charge LV.1, Soul Reaping Wind LV.1, Existential Sense Danger LV.1, Curse of Exhaustion LV.1, Mortal Reminder LV1, Grasp of the Undying LV.1, Undying Guard LV.1, Armor of Vengeances LV.1, Siphoning Soul Blade LV.1, Soul of Death LV.1, Coating Miasma LV.1, Curse of Scourge LV.1, Greater Rays Undead LV.1, Undead, Reconstruction LV.1, Eyes of the Damned LV.1, Curse of Five Bindings LV.1, Necromity Restoration in LV.1, Death Rune Removal LV.1. Remark, a white who is able to influence the soul of others. Terrifying existence that witnesses the realm of the dead. If it were in tea for the lack of knowledge that he has inside his empty skull, he would already be a calamity. At every cost, avoid confrontation against the undead named Rue Danzel. XP 310-800 Seeing his attributes, Danzel felt somewhat awkward. Considering how many attributes he gained for a level of his class, the attribute that he gained the less amount of points, that was agility, was actually his highest attribute. Where in fact his class was built to focus on strength, intelligence, and endurance. He didn't he regret putting so many points into his agility as it helped him immensely in any situation. But watching his intelligence surpass the other two core attributes of his made him feel quite awkward. New dear eyes at n slash bell slash b slash i slash end. Co. I need to change that, Danzel thought to himself as he stared at the remaining free attribute points that waited to be distributed. But as much as he wanted to increase his strength, Danzel felt the need to start increasing his defense capabilities with all the new healing capabilities that he gained. As the mutants who barely were of the third tier were capable to inflict his damage even with his armor on. Sure, they had a strong body, but they generally couldn't he use any skills at all. When he checked some of the statuses of those mutants, most of their skills were passive ones with rarely some active skills. If his opponent were an expert of the third tier and managed to land a hit on his skull while using a skill, then Danzel would even make a trip on the realm of death before coming back and killing that fellow. Never the case, Danzel was starting to think it was better in focusing his attribute somewhere else instead of agility. Instead of being a swift reaper, he was considering becoming a tank with healing capabilities. Though both had their merits, Danzel found the latter to be much more disgusting to face. With such thought in mind, Danzel distributed the remaining attribute points. He put 27 points in strength, making his strength 700. Next, he put a total of 59 points into his endurance, making it 650 with the last four points going towards his agility for the sake of turning his agility at 940. If one considered the effect of superior undead, Danzel would even gain plus 70 strength, plus 94 agility, plus 72 intelligence, and plus 65 endurance. That bonus would be doubled if he was further influenced by the talent Sin of Wrath, bringing his already monstrous strength a step closer to the fourth tier. I wonder how close I will be after evolving my class. Considering the attribute points I will gain, I should be able to fight against a fourth tier expert, I think, Danzel thought to himself. Though he didn't he want to arrogantly believe that he can win against a fourth tier, he couldn't he help but think that he could have a slight change if he further upgrade his Black Guard class. No, 
It us better not seek trouble with any fourth tear any time soon when I am still a white. Only when I become a death knight will I be able to face other fourth tears. Seeing I also revealed myself to Velker, he should still want to use my runes. He even sent Vanessa to simply guard a duke's son with me. In other words, the mission is nothing more than to keep me busy whereas Vanessa is my bodyguard. Danzel mumbled out loud while seating on his bed. Activating the spatial ring of storage that Velker had given him, Danzel found a total of three large books with the mentioned supplies. Taking out the books and scanning them, he found out that they were books that contained the knowledge of magic. The first book titled, Learnings of Wicked Magic for Beginners held subjects that would interest someone that needed the basics and had information for the first and second tier. The second book is titled Studius of Necromancy by Reviver Veleron. This one was as much more advantage Necronomicon that he himself possessed and was three times higher than the first book. One could easily use it to smash one's head with this thing. The last book was titled Elemental Magic of Spell Studies, which, like the first book, contained information for beginners, but more focused on the element aspects. Once he opened that book, a letter dropped to the floor. Picking it and reading its content, Danzel was more sure of his theory than before. My discipline, Danzel. No, our relationship is more of a transaction than that of a master and disciplined one. Though I can t personally teach you as I have some unfinished business, the books I sent you should be enough to satisfy your hunger for knowledge. I also provided you a battlefield for you to improve your skills with living targets, though I forced you to place yourself guarding that noble kid for the next couple of months. I realize that you want to keep our relationship only to transactions wise and I wish to respect such conditions. Since we are a part of the same race, I am sure this will turn out into a long-term relationship that benefits both of us. Burn this letter, Velker. Long-term relationship, huh? Danzel mumbled before taking a ruined contract out of his storage ring. Imputing his mana into the piece of paper, dark green flames engulfed the contracted. Throwing the letter into the burning contract, Soon both pieces of paper were engulfed in fire and soon enough both pieces of paper turned into ashes. Though it was kinda wasteful on his part, Danzel didn't he mind too much spending his contracts. Velker provided him with enough paper to make another couple hundred of them. Though Danzel was still somewhat skeptical of Velker's plans for him, making some relationships with a fourth-tier lich wasn't he that bad. He could provide him with runes and Belker could provide him with several items and equipment. Though he still held the fear of being enslaved similar to when he was with Hansen, he couldn't he do much about it. When he went to join the mercenary group and meet the necromancer which was Velker, he didn't he really expect to be found out to be the rinsmith known as Rue Danzel. He could lie about his rune sword, but... He couldn't he lie about the fact that every single item of his was a ruined item. For the better or the worse, being found out gave him many benefits he couldn't he even hope to gain before. As for the future consequences, I will let my future self deal with them, Danzel thought to himself. It wasn't he like he could do anything other than enjoy the benefits in front of him. With those three books, my total collection increased by a total of five magic books. Nurse and Ross' book also needs to be studied. I could make the crystal that he gave me into some sort of orb, but... Shaking his head, Danzel lay on the bed that was way too small for him. It even started making cringing noise with the total weight of his bones and armor. Will even a couple of months be enough to even finish a single one of those things? Danzel mumbled to himself before starting to read the book of Nurse and Ra. And without even realizing it, several hours passed and the next morning came. Asterisk knock, knock. Hey, duh, I mean Abdale. Come out already. We need to go. Vanessa said while continuously knocking on his door. The door itself started shaking and it wouldn't he be a surprise if Vanessa punched a hole through the door. Sigh is it so hard remembering one name. 
Danzel cursed under his helmet before closing the book that he was reading. Putting all the books that he had in his storage ring, he stood up from his bed and opened the door. Where do we need to go? Danzel asked while looking down at Vanessa the Dark Elf. Compared to her, he was massive in size, but if Vanessa really wanted to, she could probably send him to the realm of the dead without him being able to react. That guy will told me that we will be going somewhere much further away from this castle. Probably on another battlefield. She shrugged her shoulders. Nodding his head, Danzel followed behind Vanessa, who was guided to where the others were. Once the knights saw him appear, many gave him looks of dissatisfaction and hatred at him for obvious reasons. After killing some of their own for what they considered unreasonable, many started talking behind his back, calling him Abdiel the Cruel. The other three mercenaries only gave him a wary expression which was reasonable on their part. Compared to him, Vanessa's reputation was much better, be it because of her beauty or the fact that she brought several heads of some of the elite units of the enemy forces. Also, the fact that she was a fourth tier made the more ambitious people to looking for opportunities to lick her boots to gain her favor. In turn, Danzel looked at all those knights with total apathy. He considered all those knights nothing more than portable corpses that were available for his use. The only that interested him was the window in front of him. Requirement. Kill over 10,000 of the living with your own hands. Currently achieved. 815-10000. Currently, in a mountain range near, a group of people stared at the distant castle that was once owned by the dynasty. This is our next target. If we fail to take over it by today, not only will reinforcement come from their side and we will be forced to retreat. A robed figure holding an orb said to the other group. So if we fail, all the walking that we done would be for nothing? A cloaked figure said with annoyance. Her voice is clearly feminine. Among the whole group, she excluded a crushing pressure far superior to the whole group. All right then, you guys wait here, and I will clear the whole dash. Do you know if the castle holds a fourth tier expert? A chilling voice interrupted the cloaked woman. Turning her head towards the knight who wore dark armor, she frowned slightly. Do you want to do it? Instead of answering her, the knight stared at the robed figure as if waiting for his answer. As far as our information goes, there should be a couple of third tier with several that reached the second tier. I also heard that among them were a few phoenix warriors, but among them, there shouldn't he be a fourth tier expert. I believe that Miss Vanessa would be more suitable for. No, I will go. The chilling voice said while looking at the cloaked woman, which was the dark elf Vanessa. Let me do it. Sighing to herself, she shrugged her shoulders at him. The other group of three people looked at their exchange with frowns. Then it is only right that I follow suit, Abdiel. I specialize in those sorts of missions. A dark cloaked man said who held daggers in his hands. Silently agreeing with the rogue, the dark knight sends out a mental command. You all follow me, Dot. And right behind the group of those people, a dark mist started creeping near them with many, many footsteps to be heard. The dark mist hid the owners of all those footsteps, but one could clearly feel through the ground that they were more than a hundred people walking in the dark mist. The only thing visible through the mist was several dark green lights. The dark knight taking the lead had his sword flashed with the same dark green light that brought an extremely ominous feeling by just looking at the blade. But even those lights were soon engulfed by the dark mist and blended in the forest and drawing closer to the faraway castle right under the dark knight, currently in the walls of the same castle. The walls surrounding the castle were constantly being patrolled with soldiers looking at the surroundings for potential threats with vigilance. They were specifically instructed not to take their jobs lightly and to be always on the lookout for enemies. But after several weeks of seeing only a few rabbits coming out of the forest, it was bound for a few of those soldiers to be less vigilant. I wonder how much longer we will be stationed here. 
a soldier said with a bored expression to his colleague. Get a grip already. If one of the leaders catches wind of you slacking, I will also be dragged into your mess. Huh. As if they come out in the middle of the night. Wherever I look at the forest is just the same. We also have several experts that reach the third tier in the castle, who would even dare to attack us. Still, stay on your guard. Those last months, they have been rumors that the dynasty has been acting suspiciously near our territory. Right, right. All the rumors about a necromancer or whatnot. As far as I see, where we're are there is nothing but trees. The slacking soldier said, before extending his spear to his colleague. Hold this for me. Nature calls to me, and she is quite impatient. He said with a grin. Sigh if any of the leaders come. Don't he expect me to side with you? Yes, yes. Seeing him leaving, his colleague shook his head before focusing on watching the usual scenery. But today he noticed something different. Bits of dark mist seemed to appear for a split second before disappearing again. Mist? But it hasn't he rained for days. Asterisk crack. Hearing suddenly a noise, the soldier immediately became alerted and bent to see where the noise came from. And what he saw there gave him almost a heart attack. There was a knight equipped with dark-plated armor, standing in a spear that pierced the wall itself. Once those two made eye contact, the soldier felt an overwhelming bloodlust crawling to his neck. With every part of his body screaming danger, the soldier raised up from his bent position and yelled out to alarm the others. At least that's what he hoped to do. The man suddenly felt an enormous pain going through his chest, and before he knew it, he was dragged towards the edge of the wall, making him start falling. But rather than meeting the ground, he came to face with the dark knight who pierced his sword through his hurt while covering the man's mouth. He wanted to yell, but he felt the grip of the dark knight close to crashing his jaw. Soon enough, he lost all his strength soon after drawing his last breath. But that wasn't he the end of the Dark Knight's plans. With an ominous aura seeping inside the corpse of the soldier, the man once again opened his eyes and started looking around the forest as if he was genuinely patrolling. Everything that just happened went unnoticed by the many patrols that were only a few ten meters away, mainly because the Dark Knight's presence was almost non-existence. His steps seemed to blend in a dark mist and leaving none of any notice or his aura out for others to notice. Leaving the undead soldier to continue his duty, the dark knight left like a phantom towards the location of a presence. If it weren't for the dark mist hiding his presence and the sound of his armor, he would have already been found out by now. In his path, he assassinated another two of the patrolling soldier with terrifying speed. Once the remaining life has left its mortal body, it disappeared into the thin air. Once he arrived at the door where the presence was, that very presence opened the door. Ha! Huh. There is nothing better than taking a leak while slacking in work. But with that serious fellow, I better go back before he reports me. There is no need to go back, a chilling voice said. Who is there? Of course. The only answer he got was being grabbed by the neck like a helpless chicken. The dark knight that was several meters away crossed the distance in an instant. He couldn't react at all. Aku Dash. Who are Ak? Dead men don't need to know. Suddenly, the dark knight's gauntlet started to glow in an ominous dark green light. The man's eyes shrunk in horror as he felt his vitality being drained. Stop. Please spare Dash. His pleas fell on deaf ears. His struggles became weaker and soon enough, the soldier became an empty husk of dried up skin. His face was full of horror and tears. But like the two others, he disappeared. Storage rings are truly the best tool to hide bodies after all. He mumbled before entering the door of where the man came from. MHM, there are five other people in a range of eyes of the damned. Those others should be my target. The plan of Danzel, the Dark Knight, was simple. 
Kill as many as possible before the enemy realizes his presence. Though those guys that he killed were small fries, it was better to lower the numbers of the enemy now rather than later, when his misdeeds were found out. It seems it was worth investigating a portion of the XP that I gained those last few months into upgrading the presentless steps into the third tier. Such skill comes really handy in such an undercover situation. A total of six months passed after he upgraded to his main class after all. The amount of XP that he gained through each battlefield and his two harvesters was enormous. New SDRIs at N slash Bell slash V slash I slash end. Co. He had enough XP to even upgrade the skill which he didn't use as much. One of them was Presentless Steps, which turned into the third tier skill, Missed Presence. The modification was Soul Affinity and Overall Improvement. Thanks to being of soul affinity, several of the skill and talents that improve this type of affinity increased the power of the skill to much greater heights. Even though Danzel didn't specialize in being a sneaky snake and all, those bonuses were enough to bring him a step lower than Rogue. The skill is essential, but his presence in an ethereal plane makes his usual senses or way to spot him way harder than usual. The only disadvantage was that he constantly leaked dark most out of his body. At night it was handy to camouflage himself in the darkness, but in the day, it would prove awkward to sneak around or hide. I wasted enough time here. I should start clearing all others before I dash. Enemy. Before he could finish his thoughts, the yells of soldiers began echoing all around the castle. If Danzel had a face, he would be frowning right now. He was sure that he didn't leave any evidence except the soul undead. But even then, that's too fast of reaction. He was sure that he wasn't found out when he was sneaking in here. He also put the corpses in his storage ring and did not even leave bits of blood on the floor. Going through the different possibilities, Danzel's ethereal eyes flare up. This dumbass must even get caught in the act. Danzel, of course, cursed the rogue that volunteered to come with him. Back then, he didn't say anything as that guy Ken specialized in being sneaky. No matter. I guess I will have to move the plan forward. In the next moment, he let sever all of the corpses out of his storage ring to fall to the ground. Many of them were his slain enemy of the past months and few of his allies. What each corpse had in common was that each armor had the same rune carved on the inside of the armor. The corpses in total number more than 40. Let's see the results of the new version of this run. He said before spreading his dead mana inside each armor of the corpses. Having received the news that an enemy infiltrate the castle, everyone tensed up, but none of them showed a hint of panic. Most of them searched around the castle in groups, while others came to reinforce the walls in case an attack comes. Among these reinforcements, they were a few magic casters in their ranks. Even if the Barum Kingdom favored life force users the most, that didn't mean none was practicing the ways of magic arts. Though most of them would be frowned at considering their nemesis being the Arcana Kingdom, a place where magic casters drive. But even then, the fundamental rule of the strong being of respect was always there. And magic, by its essence, held many advantages that the life force couldn't replicate. The most obvious is the range difference. In a fight between groups and armies, it wasn't unreasonable to say that magic casters were the biggest threat in a war. Their weakness was that most of the time, their bodies were weak, and getting close to them spelled death to them. But being on top of several meters high walls, they could rain hell on whoever tried to raid the castle. Any sights of the enemy? One of the magic casters asked the patrolling team. No, the forest is still quiet as always. But, seeing the hesitation on the soldier's face, the magic caster in turn frowned. What is it? Did you notice something? Or are you trying to keep information from the army? W what? No, no. It might be just my imagination, but doesn't the forest look gloomier than usual? Hearing that, everyone looked at the forest with a frown on their face. 
Some of them saw nothing unusual. Some also confirmed the soldiers' claim that the forest was indeed much gloomier than before. Once the magic caster lays his eyes on the forest, his face is also distorted into a frown. This is. Maybe it was because it was the night that others couldn't see the difference, but to a magic caster whose sense of mana was stronger, he could identify the dark most that shrouded the forest. If it was a normal mist, he wouldn't even bother to give it a second glance, but seeking a mana-infested mist was too strange. Na slash w novel chapt rs are published on no slash bell slash bin co slash m. And right at that moment, with the help of his mana enchanting his eyesight, he saw sever all figures coming through the mist. The enemy. There are enemy troops in the forest. As soon as he alerted the others, a cry of pain sounded through the distance. Kaiwag. Turning their heads towards the commotion, everyone's eyes widen in surprise. As a man sunk his very own teeth at one of their colleagues with a ferocious expression on his face. His finger grows twice as long and they harden to the point that they became sharp claws, digging into the chest of the poor soldier who is being eaten alive. While this cannibal was busy feasting on one of their own, another four of those cannibals appeared from his side and dashed with unnatural move towards the living. Though they moved unfit for the living, their speed far surpassed the leverage of second-tier Joe, and their killing intent broke through the roof. Stop them. The soldiers push forward their spears, waiting for the enemy to come close enough to impale them. Flees Aya. With a sweep of their claws, they push the spears to the side while digging their free claw right into their chest. The armor that those soldiers had penetrated and cut like butter. Nothing could save those soldiers from their fate. You monster. A fire. Head my call and burn my enemies. Fire swept. Raising his staff, the magic caster cast his spell which engulfed the cannibals and their prey in a wave of fire. Though it might have been seen as merciless in burning his allies, the magic caster knew that they were done with such injury through their chest. Kaya. Estop. Help. Their cries of help soon calmed down after a while, but after the fire had gone out, while the soldier lay down dead, the four cannibals were standard tall. Their skin was burned to the point where their muscles could be seen, but soon enough their wounds of them started to heal at a rapid past. Food. Flesh. Kill. Human. While still injured, the four cannibals started charging at the other soldiers who were shocked at their regeneration. And those guys weren't the only ones that were facing those guys. All around the castle, groups of those cannibals rampaged and ravaged the flesh of the living. Those who had a third-tier expert had it the easiest, as they were capable to slay those monsters. But those a tier below had trouble facing them. The magic caster who saw the unusual regeneration of them and the long claws had finally come to recognize what those things were. Damn it. From where did does undead come from? Hearing the key information, a nearby asked with a desperate tone, What? What kind of undead are they? Raising his staff, the magic caster answered, They are ghouls. Undead known for their unending hunger and regeneration similar to that of a troll. Unless someone finished them with one single attack, then one should be prepared to become the meal of that undead. Luckily for these soldiers, they had an overwhelming number difference against those few ghouls. And most of them were of the second tier with a magic caster backing them from the rear. In turn, the ghouls were divided and used no strategy at all, and moved like animals driven by their instinct alone. The surprise attack of the ghouls did make some casualties among them, but after getting the situation under control, it didn't even take them a minute to finish the ghouls off. Who mends? Icy circle. With a sharp circle blade shooting in the last ghoul's head, it dropped to the ground unmoving. It took them a total of two minutes to get everything under control. At the time of the surprise attack, they failed to realize the true intent of the ghoul's appearance. 
But soon enough, everyone started to find out by the screeching noise of the gate of the wall. Fui cri cri cri. With the noise attracting everyone as 22 attention, those who were close enough only now noticed the several corpses that were spread on the walls. The leaves controlling the gate were pulled down and broken, making every attempt to stop the gate from opening futile. Waiting in the middle of the gate down to the ground was a sole figure wearing dark plated armor. Seeing all that happening, the magic caster had a flashback of the dark mist in the forest. Impossible. Was this their true aim? Bringing his head to look down the walls, he like many other people noticed the walls being shrouded by a dark mist. But even if they realized it now, now it was too late. The gate fully opened, revealing the dark mist. A huge wolf figure with metal-like claws and a three-eyed skull came walking together with an army of undead behind his steps. Each of them had the ethereal dark green eyes in common. They couldn't have expected this of happening. While the dark mist hid the undead army from other sight, the distraction that the ghouls served with their loud yells covered the noise that the undead army was making. Nonetheless, the gate was heavily guarded by several third-tier experts, each of them being strong enough to face an army of hundred of the second-tier soldiers. But not only were those guys massacred in such a short amount of time, but they didn't even manage to warn the others who were focused on the loud and ferocious ghouls. Leaving them in the current situation where the undead army came right through the front door of their own house. Hurry up and stop them. Don't let the undead in the castle. Hearing the command of someone, the soldiers of Barum quickly moved. Danzel, the mastermind behind all this, could only chuckle to himself. Hee <laughs> hee, you guys are too late. Looking at his undead troops entering the castle, he sends out his command. My undead. Head my command. Turning his back on his undead army, he pointed his sword forward. Go and slaughter them all. Leave none of them alive. Kegwa. Skull crawl howl spread to his surroundings, making every soldier who heard it shake unconsciously. For our leech. For our leech. For our leech. Every undead chanted at the same time as the advantage forward. Their chilling voice turned into a terrifying echo as their footsteps seemed about to bring an earthquake to this mortal realm. Lowering his sword, the liege of that undead stepped forward. It seems like everything has gone according to plan. It was worth improving the runes of those ghouls. I wonder where this incompetent rogue is currently. Danzel thought for a moment before shaking his head. No matter, for now, I will just harvest some of those guys. Chaos quickly spread through the walls. The Barum side might have more numbers generally, but as of one everyone, one of them was spread through the whole base, where the undead army walked in like a wave of death. Many of the humans died, keeping the undead busy long enough for them to gather a force strong enough to face them. Among that force were several of the third-tier experts who were easily able to cut down the undead forces. The only thing that they managed to achieve was attracting the master of all those undead. Wielding a black kite shield with a half-skull expression carved in the metal together with an ominous sword that leaked dark green light, once he appeared in front of those experts their fate was set. They barely were able to send out a few swings with their own weapon, and those were easily blocked by the blackened kite shield. As when the master of that undead swung his sword, they couldn't even react properly to avoid it completely. The constitution of a third tier did allow them to survive even if they were cut once or twice. But once they were, they felt as if a part of their very own soul has been cut apart. But even without such pain distracting them, the power that the Dark Knight had was just too overwhelming. They almost lose grip of their weapon when they clashed with them. How? Is that guy still on the third tier? Their internal cries, though we swiftly became silent. They even went out of their way to focus solely on the Dark Knight with several second tiers and a total five of third tier experts. Alas, even those guys were cut apart without even managing to wound the Dark Knight. 
Good thing they decided to come at me. Having them wreck my undead would have been annoying. Danzel said as his dead mana traveled towards his sword. Now, serve upon my will. The nearby people who were fighting to the death couldn't help but get cold sweat in seeing the corpses of the third tiers and their colleagues raise from the dead and lash out at them. Though it was already obvious, it only now downed them that death meant being enslaved in the form of undead. That also meant that their allies would become their enemies if they die. Worse of all was that the undead were quite tough to kill. They weren't any weaker than them physically. That was the terrifying advantage of a necromancer. While the enemy would only lose soldiers, the army of the dead would only grow stronger. Of course, the school of necromancy lacked a certain lethality in their own spells, but their spells were already vicious enough that it wasn't even a disadvantage. And against a necromancer that couldn't be beaten, the Barum could only watch their former allies raising as undead and overwhelming them one-sidedly. Skullclaw herself also proved to be a force of herself as she was able to use her strength against melee opponents. Normal weapons with the strength of the second-tier soldiers could barely scratch her legs and the third tier that focused on her had their attack phase through her body as if she was a ghost. The few magic casters on the side of the Barum proved to be the ones with the most kills with their AoE spells. Sadly for them, they were the first put on Danzel's target list. The soldiers could hold their own against the undead to keep their magic casters safe, but against the Dark Knight, they could only cry for help. The fight only lasted a total of 15 minutes with few soldiers retreating into the castle and barricading themselves from the undead. As for Danzel's side, he was able to double the number of his undead. They even hidden inside, huh? HMPF, they are nothing more than trapped rats now. He scoffed while turning towards his undead. The 30 of you follow me. The rest of you surround the castle in case some of them escape. Also, gather the corpses of the ghouls and bring them here. With his orders spread among his undead, they quickly went out to work. The only ones that stayed were thirty of his draugers and Skull Claw with her head lowered, fully displaying her begging eyes to her master. Maybe if she were a dog or a cat, she might even looked cute. But her species itself wasn't made to be cute as the head didn't have any flesh even after death. Skull Claw, you go around and search for those who might be hiding. With that new eye of yours, you should be able to do so, no? Nodding her head, she sprinted in search of prey to present her master with. She wasn't going to disappoint her leech. As to why Danzel sent his strongest undead to basically to Aaron's, it was because he didn't want to destroy the very same castle that they were going to be using. He could even try to destroy the gate and begin his own slaughter with his undead if he wanted to. For the sake of sparing some of his mana and not destroying the castle, he came up with this plan. Though it seems I will be forced to break the castle gates, he said while walking on the castle gate. Raising his sword, he swung at the gate with all his strength, but surprisingly his sword got repealed. For a short instance, a blur light appeared in the gate before disappearing. A barrier, huh? Danzel said before touching the gate with his hand. Reading the barrier, it seemed to be that it used mana to block the damage. Then there must be a limit of the mana. Sending a command on his undead, they all began to swing towards the gate nonstop. Danzel could have also swung to fasten the process, but he decided against it. It's a matter of time anyways. And soon enough, the mana fueling the barrier reached its limit. Move to the side, Danzel said as a dark green light escaped his sword. Swinging it down, a soul-reaping blade pierced through the gate and opened a small gap for the undead to enter. Asterisk Boom. Stepping inside the castle, rows of Barum soldiers waited in a line. They seemed to expect that the whole army of the undead would come, but unexpectedly only thirty undead with the necromancer came walking in. That, though, didn't cheer them at all. They came to know that the master of all those undead beings was powerful enough to single-handling fight five third-tier experts with ease. 
Among the group of people, two figures came walking in the front, one with a phoenix helmeted and a sword in his hand while the other held a staff in his hand. Their auras are much stronger than the ones I fought before. Danzel thought as he stepped forward, commanding his undead to stay put. Each party stopped moving. There was a moment of silence between them and Danzel, but that didn't last for long. Giant strength, the magic caster said, engulfing his teammate with his spell. He didn't waste his time in the moment of silence, and he already was preparing his spell. With the current information in hand, the necromancer in front of them was extremely powerful. Though using the soldiers as a meat shield would allow him to fire freely his spell at him, it also risked raising the army of the necromancer numbers. They were already glad that they didn't see hundreds of undead rushing to them. But he wasn't the only one who wasn't wasting time. Curse of Chaining Fatigue With a dark mist shooting out of his body, it traveled towards the phoenix swordsman. TCH, a curse? The phoenix warriors said in annoyance. The dark mist soon enough entered the sword and body. He didn't even try to resist. And invisible to the eyes of the other, ethereal chains appeared and bonded around the legs of the swordsman, draining his stamina and also weighting him down. He tried cutting the chains with his sword, but it only phases though. That spell was the upgraded version of Curse of Exhaustion in its modification stage. Two months ago, he chose both Dead Mana Affinity and Soul Affinity in the range the options. Back then, he was most surprised to see the Permanent in Cost of Power option. If he chose that, Danzel guessed that he would truly gain the infamous version of curses, the ones that last forever. Though after thinking about it, he decided to choose both affinities as the curse of exhaustion was his favorite curse. Though he wasn't using curses all that much, that was because there wasn't a need to do so. If he judged that he could kill his enemy, why spend his mana cursing him on the top? That would have been overkill on his side. As for why he casts it now, it was because he felt that those two could actually put a fight against him. Let's see how he handles another one. He mumbled to himself, N E slash W novel chapped RS are published on no slash bell slash bin. Co slash M. Hearing that, the swordsman dashed towards Danzel.